I got a schedule, sir. I'm gonna pin my leaves on before I'm 28. I'm gonna have my eagles before I'm 32. When I'm 38, I'm gonna have a star. Maybe two. General Alfred, by God, Olivetti. That's my schedule, sir. <laughs> Very proper schedule, Al. Very proper indeed. Just like an express train. And you'll do it, too. Um, all right. So this is the... Uh, so we've just looked at the clip with the major and the captain talking about the captain's uh, plans for promotion. What's important about this particular, the reason I included this clip as opposed to dozens of others, because really the whole film is just so, um, the whole thing is just, it's so completely a, a thoughtful take on what's going on. And it's based on the novel by uh, Daniel Ford called Incident at Mukwa, which is not a place name. You'll notice as well if you're, if an Alice in Wonderland, if you're an Alice in Wonderland fan that uh, the Major says, uh, you know, what is Boojum doing in the red? It should be Mung Tao. Uh, Boojum comes right from the um, hunting of the snark and, uh, or Lewis, Chuck Dodgson's, oh my goodness, jeez, <laughs> Lewis Carroll's um, long poem about the hunting of the snark. Uh, because it's a it's a snark hunt basically. I mean, it's 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 uh, it's the land of the ridiculous. I mean, except it's everybody's getting killed, and this is the same point that Michael Hare makes about Daffy Duck. That's sort of like Daffy Duck in a in a in a murderous cartoon. Um, so that's that particular reference. Anyway, why did I choose this little piece with the two soldiers talking? Because the major has given up um, his ambitions. That's it. He's a major. He's gonna. Re he's looking forward to retiring if he doesn't get killed, and which he does. Um, the captain is ambitious and he wants to, he's got a plan. He's going to be a colonel, which is what the, the, uh, the, the wings are going to be. This, this is the bird, um, which is the sign of the, of the colonel on his shoulder. And he says, and I'm going to have a star, maybe two, uh, he'll be a general. So a full bird colonel is the closest thing you can get to being a general without being a general. Then you're, you're a general. There are these levels of being a general. So that's what Al is talking about. And that's useful because uh, what's important about Vietnam, was understood about Vietnam in the early 60s, was that it was a way for young officers to get ahead because they had to, to be advanced. They had to go and get field experience. There had to be a shooting war. Well, Vietnam was known as was in the military, was told the soldiers as the only war we had. I mean, people talked about Vietnam and they often described it as this is the only war we've got. So if you were going to get uh, promoted, you had to go to Vietnam and you had to get field experience. As the war in Vietnam heated up and as it became an American war, the pressure on young officers increased rather than decreased. So what they began to do was they began to allow lieutenants, uh, which is what happens with uh, Corsi's, uh, oh, I can't remember his name. Uh, he's, you know, the decent guy who basically, you know, gets, uh, is sort of this hapless, um, you know, doing his best, but not very bright and so on. Lieutenant is that he would only have been allowed in the field for six months. And the reason he's got to clear out is that he's got to make space for another lieutenant who was going to come in. And so this was known as ticket punching. because you had to go to Vietnam and essentially have your ticket punched for the ride. And then if you survived it, you came back and you would be promoted captain to captain to major to colonel, whatever it was. So Vietnam was understood as very good for the military because it promoted, it killed off a bunch of, of junior officers who were bad news as far as they were concerned because they were basically, they were either had bad luck or they were bad in the field or whatever reasons, you know, too bad for them, basically. The people who survived got promoted uh, if they stayed. And this these are people who remember want to be career military. They're, those are military families. Um, some of you may be from military families. And uh, very often, uh, as happens with many ways of life, uh, what you observe your parents going through, you think, yeah, that looks okay. I'm going to go do that. Um, same thing is true with military families. So you'll have, say, five generations of military families. 
Um, and it's much more likely that you're going to be military if your families are military. Um, this study has just been done recently. Uh, so what we've got here is a career officer who expect, who was ticket punching. And as long as he doesn't get killed, at, the, at this point, the war is slow moving enough that he probably can stay out of the way. And remember that the colonel, who is a step away from being a general, wants to be promoted. So the importance of uh, Mukwa, this, uh, again, another fake name, uh, fake Vietnamese place name uh, that Daniel Ford created, um, is deliberately because he basically he, he's talking about it being a muck war um, is to uh, have a success have a field success and if you have a field success well you can uh, go ahead for promotion so it's important because this is military uh, ambitions here are driving them into the field right they're not just sitting around saying oh well you know let's hope we survive which is what Barker is likely to do. It's the colonel who is above him, who wants, is ambitious and wants to be promoted. Okay. In such a case, the American depot would desire the return of the shells, would it not? In the whole history of the United States, they never asked for the return of anything, be it guns, money, boats, or how it's the shells. They wouldn't know how to ask for the return of anything. If they did, it would screw up the bookkeeping, and everybody in Washington would have a goddamn nervous breakdown. You tell the colonel. Okay, I'll recognize the uh, back end of this clip from the earlier clip. Uh, the point is that Asa is aware that the United States has until this point, especially in the Second World War, given away war materiel. So remember materiel, M-A-T-E-R-I-E-L, E with excellent aigu, means military stuff, uh, everything, bombs, planes, you know, you name it. It's, if it's military, that's materiel. And the way that the Americans, although Roosevelt tried to get America involved in World War II earlier uh, at uh, Churchill's desperate request, uh, Roosevelt was unable to get the American will uh, basically to join World War II. They were like, no, we, this is not our war, we're fine, blah, until they were attacked by the Japanese in 1941 at Pearl Harbor, and then they were like, okay, we're in this now, and they declared war on Japan. And typically that, as it had in World War I, brought about the alliances, and so, and so then basically there was a declaration of war on Germany as well, and the Axis, the Allied powers on uh, Italy, and so on, all the fascist powers. Okay, um, the issue is that at the in World War II, what Roosevelt could do, even if he couldn't join, put American forces in to support British forces and the Allies, was that he could give them stuff. And so the Americans began what was called the Lend-Lease Act, uh, which was incredibly important because it basically made... Um, planes and tanks, well, mostly planes, uh, ships and things like that, American ships available so that American industry tooled up for the war and they were running full throttle. And they were giving the stuff, well, they were lending it, they were giving it to Britain um, and lending it with the proviso that it basically never needed to be returned um, and just needed to be used. So Britain fought uh, its war uh, initially using American material. This went on happening during the war where America was wealthy and became wealthier and wealthier. I mean, this is how America became a world power. World War II made America in world, into a world power and broke Great Britain as a world power. Um, okay. The, uh, so here is the same discussion where the um, everything has always been coming out of the United States. It's always the, the, the everything has been going out from it, never coming back to it. And Asa is trying to explain this, that you know, and which he knows very well. The United States does not know how to take back. It only knows how to give. But the gifts are colonial ones, in the sense that they, they, it looks like they're for freedom and democracy and all that stuff. But it really, you have to sign on to the American way of life 
and everything that it entails. So um, he's a, is, this is a, he is a, he's almost removed from the scene in, in this witnessing uh, American power. He's, he, he looks at it in a very sort of, with a very sort of amused, sad uh, kind of way. He remembers what America was and he sees that this is not, this is not that. This war is not that. This is not fitting. It is not fitting for America to have gotten into this war. 